bump or high five or shake their hand, do something. I don't know if you're as excited as I am about you being here this morning, but uh, I, I really am truly excited about you choosing to be here when you could be so many other places in this world, uh, in this city, uh, in, this, in, in and around your home. You, you chose to be here this morning, and I'm so grateful for that because uh, last week we finished up our series for the summer, and uh, we gave you some very clear direction from our leadership. And if you failed to, to see uh, that video last week from our, our, our leadership here at the church, uh, you can see it. We posted it out on Facebook. It's on social media. It's on Twitter. It's on uh, some of our other accounts. And you can just go there and it's on YouTube and you can see what, exactly the direction of our church. And if you haven't been to church for a while, maybe you missed us a couple weeks here and there during the summer, uh, it's a great way for you to get catch up and just, just hear from the hearts of our leaders exactly what is needed from you, exactly what we think and feel God is calling us to be and do. Uh, it's with an incredible, deliberate push that we're putting that out there for you because we want you to be involved in, in the process at some level. We want you to be a part of our team for sure. Listen, a Washington Redskin fan and a New York Giant fan and a Dallas Cowboy fan found themselves in a shared business hotel room in Saudi Arabia, and they also were sharing a bottle of bourbon. When the police, when the police knocked down the door and immediately came in and arrested the individuals, the three fans of those teams, as they were getting ready to watch uh, an NFL game, and then they, they confiscated their alcohol because... Uh, it was punishable by death to possess alcohol in that, in that particular region of the world. And on the day of their trial, their judge, their judge was this benevolent sheik from Saudi Arabia who was also uh, married and said, listen, I, I'm not going to punish you to death. Um, the good thing is I am going to let you go, but the bad thing is I'm going to have to give you 20 lashes from, as a punishment. And again, when they started to dole out the punishment, the, the Saudi sheik showed up one more time to, just to, to, to speak to them. And he said, hey, I, I just want you to know that my wife is a huge fan of the NFL in America. And she, she's asked me to give you guys a little bit of a break. And so she, he said these words to the three fans. He said, listen, I'm going to give you each one wish. And whatever you wish, we will grant as long as it's within reason, what do you want? Well, the, the Washington Redskin fan was first to go, and he, he sat there and he thought about it for a little while, and he, he thought about it for some more, and he said, well, could, could, I, could I have a pillow? Could you, could you tie a pillow to my back? And they said, well, sure, we'll tie a pillow to your back. And so they began to, to whip him with a, a whip, and after 10 lashes, the pillow literally shredded to pieces, and it fell to the ground around his feet, and he received 10 more lashes on a bare back. And he crumbled to the ground at the feet of those who were punishing him, and he began to cry like a little baby. And they carried him off. The New York Giant fan was watching what had happened, and it was his turn, and he, they brought him to the center of the room, and they said, well, what, what is it that you wish? And he, he thought a, bit, a little bit longer, a little bit harder about what it was that he would want. And he said, well, after what I just saw, could you, could you strap, could you tie two pillows to my back? And they said, well, sure, we'll tie two pillows to your back. And they began to, to whip this New York Giant fan. After about 15 lashes into the, the, the punishment, the pillows began to crumble too. And he received five lashes to a very bare back. And he too fell to the ground, crying in pain like a little, little baby. They picked him up and they hauled him off. And it became time for the New York or the, the Dallas Cowboy fan who was standing there watching all this take place. And, and the, the sheik interrupted one last time. And he said, listen, I, I hear that you are a fan. That you cheer for the greatest football team in the world. He said, I, I don't want to just give you one wish. Because you're the greatest fan of the greatest team in the world, I want to give you two wishes. What do you wish for? And without hesitation, the cowboy fan, he said this. Listen, I, I want you to whip me a hundred times. Don't just beat me 20 times. And the sheik was kind of taken back by all of this. And he stepped back and he said, Wow, that, that is amazing. I understand that you're the greatest fan in the world of the Cowboys. You must be from Texas, right? 
because nobody else would be that strong and that courageous to take a hundred beatings, a hundred lashes. He said, we'll definitely do that. He said, what's your second wish? He said, well, actually, could you take that New York Giant fan and tie him to my back? <laughs> Guys, the season's almost here, right? And let me say this. It's one thing to be a fan. It's another thing to be on the team. It's one thing to cheer for things sitting in an audience like this and, and be celebratory about what's going on as you watch it. But it's a completely different thing to be on the team. And earlier in, in the year, in 2017, as 2017 started, we, we put something in front of you. We, we stood on the stage and we, we've been challenging you all year with this very simple phrase. We, we, we challenge you with this idea to become one of these, to become a leader, a leader of others, a leader of people who don't know Jesus to lead them to the place where they would eventually know Jesus. We actually ask you to write a name of a, a person that you're familiar with on the walls, and we would ask, ask and we pray and we pray and we pray every week, every day for some of those names on the wall that you would become a leader of people. We actually said, we actually gave you this phrase, every follower of Jesus must learn to lead. Every follower must learn to lead. Every follower must learn to lead. We've been hammering on that for eight months. Every follower of Jesus must learn to lead. And, and some of you, some of you have taken that to heart, but we, we kind of turned that around too and we said this, that every leader must learn to follow a leader. Every leader must learn to follow. Every leader must learn to follow as well as every follower must learn to lead. That there has to be someone you, that, that you are following, someone that you are leading. That you find yourself in the spiritual continuum all the time. I'm not talking about just leading them to be a fan. We're asking you to think about what it means to be on a team. And this idea of becoming a leader is met with such incredible, uh, it's interesting. Because I've had so many conversations with people this year uh, about, about hesitancy of becoming one of these. A hesitancy about that literally exists within you because you, you look at yourself and you answer the question that Daniel just sang. By the way, Daniel wrote that song during communion. Unbelievable. But who am I? Who, who am I to lead people? Who am I to be called by God to do what you're asking me to be? Who, who am I to stand in front of people and lead them spiritually to the point where they find Jesus? Who am I? And there's this hesitancy in us because spiritually leading other people to Jesus, you, this is what you literally say to me. I actually had somebody say this to me on Friday. Joe, you got to be kidding. I am not a leader. You got to be kidding. You really think that God wants me to be a leader in this world. You got to be kidding. Who, who me? Like, I, I'm not a leader. When I, when I look in the mirror, one thing for sure, this is not me. But as much as this role is defined in Scripture as to what God might be calling you to do, what God is actually calling all of us to be, leaders of people, not to ourselves, not just to church, but leaders of people to Jesus. Not only does this role scare a lot of you, but I think this one scares you maybe even more. To be a servant. Because when you, when you look at this, think about this. Which, which of these two roles do you resonate with? Which of these two roles repel you? Maybe you're repelled by both and you just like standing in the middle. Saying, I'd rather just stay here and be a fan instead of leading or instead of serving people. Because you, you know what? You know the character in your mind, the role that this means, this picture in your mind of what it means to be a servant. You know what's rumbling around in your head as you think about maybe a broken down person who literally has no willpower to stand up on their own, who literally gives every ounce of their life to literally no purpose in life for themselves. It's the, the role of this person is someone who just gives everything for the benefit of someone else. The, the role of this person, you, you, if you think about the picture in your mind of what it means to be a servant or to be a slave, it's, it's not even a second class person. It's, it may be a person that's not even just lower class in your mind. Maybe it's a person who has no class whatsoever. They're, they're, they're physically beaten down. They've physically been through so much in life that the lashes of life have just beaten them to the point where they're physically undesirable to look at. They, they are less than you. They are less than you. 
And may, maybe to the point where they, they become unrecognizable. The, like the only time they're ever recognized, the only time a servant is recognized is when they've messed up and they didn't do what the master said. They didn't do what was required of them. They have no name for themselves. As a matter of fact, the, their identity has been stripped from them. They, they exist solely to please their master. And, and that's a tough place to be. They have all of these expectations that are literally weighing down their shoulders. They are hardworking for sure. They, they chose to be a follower. They decided to be a follower. They decided, they made a decision to subject themselves and be submissive to whatever the request of the master is. That scares a lot of people, right? This one, though, the mental image that we have of a leader is maybe... Maybe not quite right either, because in our minds, a leader is someone who's easily recognizable. They get all the credit when things go well. They're, they're easily distinguishable. They're highly visible. They're well-dressed. They're, 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 they look the part of a leader. They have tremendous confidence. They, they have tremendous drive in this world. They can make decisions like it's so easy. They are strategic in their thinking and they possess unbelievable power to get something done. You know the picture in your mind of a leader. And they have knowledge. Like they have knowledge. And then they have the wisdom to use the knowledge that, that they possess. And then they, they, they are able to, to give guidance, clear guidance to people. And they're easy to, to, they're very good at, at, at setting a course of direction in, in a management situation and saying, this is the goal and this is, and they're not easily deterred from the path that they're setting for people. They provide purpose and meaning to those that they are follow, that are following and those that they're leading. And let me just step back and say this. One of them absorbs glory and one of them reflects glory, maybe even deflects glory to make the master look good. And, and here's the amazing thing, because you cannot stay here. You cannot stand between these two. Like which one makes you the most uncomfortable? Which one, if you were to choose a role, which one would you say, okay, this is the one I'm going to be, or this is the one I'm going to be. I'm more like this one than this one. Which, uh, which is it? Because both of these roles we approach with the exact same equal, equal ambition and equal emotion. And the statement that we make the most is, who, me? I'm not this, and I'm not this. So who am I? Who am I? Surely not me, Joe. You're, you must be joking when, when you're calling me to be a leader and you're calling me to be a servant. It's not me who's saying it. It's Jesus who makes the, the, the role, responsibility, and the decision yours. And here's, here's how we approach both of these. We approach both of them with fear. You know why? Because we, we fear to be elevated to this status. And we fear being reduced to this position. We don't want to be either. And the amazing thing to me is they are as opposite as the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants. Right? And then here's the amazing thing. That the confusion actually actually gets started when Jesus one day kind of puts them together. And he says, like no other corporation, no other organization in the world, Jesus says these actually go together. And Jesus actually says you, you need to be both of them at the same time. You need to be a servant leader. You need, you need as Jesus puts it, he goes, you need to look like me. And the critical lesson that I've learned more than anything else in my life when I look at the words of, of Scripture and I look at the life of Jesus is simply this, that Jesus taught and he embodied leadership from a servant, servant's heart. Jesus was this incredible servant leader. And Jesus was the one who, who literally understood what his mission from God was. He understood what the will of the Father was for his life. Jesus knew what it was. And he was able to lead by serving those he was leading, by serving those. It's amazing. For, for Jesus, he knew what his mission in life was. His mission in life was to be your Messiah. 
His mission in life was to be your savior. His mission in life was you, he, he knew you couldn't deal with your sin. So he had to come from his comfortable position down to earth to take care of your sin on your behalf, to serve you, to give you something that you could not get on your own, and then to lead you. See, everything that Jesus did was in service to his mission. Now, here's the, an unbelievable concept that you will easily recognize. You can't be Jesus, but you can be like Jesus. You, you can't be Jesus, but you can be like him. And as much as Jesus wanted to do so much for this world, he's calling you and I, our, our mission in life is to increase, just like Jesus, to increase people, to pull people to the heart of God, to increase the followers of Jesus Christ in this area in which we live, to lead other people to Jesus. That is our mission. We can't be him. We can't save people from their sins. But we can lead people to the one who can. And listen, our, our mission as a church our mission as a church it comes straight out of Scripture, and that is to make followers of Jesus, to become a follower of Jesus Christ and to, and to love God and the people in our community and world. We, we are actually followers of Jesus who, who daily love God and the people in our community and world. That's God's mission for this place. That's God's mission for you as a follower of his. You, you, know, your, you know what your mission is, when you can complete the statement, when, when, you, when you can fill in the blank, mission is this, God has called me to fill that blank in. And you'll know exactly what you're called to be. God has called you to be a leader, a servant leader, who brings people to him. See, mission is everything for the servant leader. That the mission that God has entrusted to his people here at Valley View is the very same one that he has entrusted to you so that your focus and every decision that you make and every action you take will lead people to him. And you see, a servant leader, he, he or she serves the mission and leads those on the mission with him. We do both at the same time. And the mission is everything. And some, some of you I know are wondering why why do you do this as a church? Why, why, why are we doing this as a church? Why are you asking us to lead others? Well, that's our mission, to inspire people to follow Jesus. And, and see, listen, if there's confusion in your life, you, if, you, if you're resistant to becoming a leader of others, let me just say this, that leadership will begin when a God-revealed vision, mission, captures you. Leadership will begin when a God-revealed mission captures a person. And if, if it hasn't captured you, a person will turn into a leader when you become servant to your mission. Servant leaders have this unbelievable passion for mission because the mission is paramount to everything that you do, everything that we do. And for Jesus, the, the, the model for which he led people was through servanthood. He was never self-serving. He was always looking out for the interest of others. He led other servants to his Father in heaven who gave him the mission here on earth. And at least three different times, Jesus stands up and he says, this is why I'm here. And he gives a mission statement for you and I to understand. And they're very clear. At least three different times, Jesus provided what you and I would call his personal mission statement. Like when Jesus stood up in his own home church, in his own hometown synagogue, he, he, he read from the scroll of Isaiah. We would say it's Isaiah chapter 61. And he said this, this is why I'm here. He said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to preach, to preach good news to the poor. He has uh, sent me here to proclaim freedom to those who are prisoners, to recover the sight to those who can't see, to, to bring and release those who are oppressed, to bring about to proclaim the year of God's favor, the year of God's blessing on your life. He said that in, as he stood one day in a church. But he stood another time in the, in the home of a, of a sinner, a tax collector named Zacchaeus. And he said, the reason why I'm here, he said this, the son of man came to seek and to save everything that is lost. 
When Jesus stood out one day and another time in front of his 12 disciples, he, he said this. He took these two words and he pushed them together. And he said, do you really want to know what greatness looks like in the kingdom? Do you really want to know what it means to God when, when you become great in his eyes is when you become both servant and leader at the same time. And if you're like me, it would have been awesome to be standing there as Jesus is talking to his 12 friends, listening in, it would have been incredible to be one of those 12 and, and to hear all of the truths that Jesus taught that day. To be able to ask questions, to be able to say, Jesus, what about this situation? What about this scenario? What about this individual item that this so-and-so is going to go through? Wouldn't it have been great to be able to hear from the mouth of Jesus just exactly what you're supposed to do? You would have thought, man, it, they must have learned how to lead from Jesus. They must have learned how to serve from Jesus, right? So wrong. Because in, in Matthew chapter 20, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 20, or you can turn there on your phone or however you get there. But in Matthew chapter 20 is one of these incredible scenes where the 12, the 12 disciples and followers of Jesus, they demonstrate just how typically normal they are. They're more like you and I than we give them credit for. Just some context. The popularity of Jesus is, is skyrocketing. And knowledge about the kingdom of God is spreading across the city and across the land. And the disciples, just like you and I, the followers of Jesus, they begin to get a little bit anxious about being recognized. Being recognized, noticed as one of the leaders in this, in this ministry, as one of the 12 chosen leaders in Jesus' circle. And what makes this account even more amazing, more interesting to me, is the presence of a mom the presence of a, of a lady, the mother of two boys. She's Mrs. Zebedee. She's the, the wife of a Galilean fisherman. She has two sons, both named James and John. And listen to what she says. When she's struggling with this issue of what her son should be, notice what her appeal to Jesus is. It says this in verse 20 of chapter 20. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her two sons. And she, she knelt down. She put herself below. She, she placed herself in a position to where she could listen and hear. She, she knelt down respectively to ask a favor. And Jesus asked her this question, what is your request? And she replied, in, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right and one on your left. Before you get too tough on this lady, this Jewish mom, she's proud of her sons. She's thought a whole lot about this request before she's ever taken the step towards Jesus. Her, her motive was probably pure, more than likely. Her idea was probably in proper perspective. She, she didn't ask that her sons occupy the central throne. Of course not. That's, that's the seat where Jesus sits. Remember, we can't be Jesus. We can only be like him. But like any good mother, she's watching out for, for those moments, those breaks in life, those deals of a lifetime, those opportunities that come very seldomly in life where there's, her sons could get a nice promotion. And she, she pushes, literally she, she makes a deliberate push for James and John to get a special seat to sit on throne number two and throne number three. She, she wanted to enhance that image of her family and before the public eye. She, she, she wanted people to think real highly of her boys. Boys who had left their nets, boys who had left the family business, boys who, who wanted to join this up and coming ministry, this boy, these boys that wanted to do something special in this world, they were already among the 12. That, that in itself was recognizable. But she, in her mind, she thought, wow, these guys are better than everyone else. Everyone but Jesus, right? And just in case you're, you're wondering, what did the other 10 guys think who were standing there? Verse 24, or 24 says this, that they became indignant. They were ticked off. Why? You would be too, right? Because those seats, we want sometimes that glory when we're a leader. We want to be easily recognized. And, 
no way were these guys going to ever give up those spots without a fight. And they got downright ticked off because James and John had got there first. And maybe we're going to get the glory that they wanted. That sounds familiar to our lives, right? Sounds familiar. And so Jesus is standing there with this woman kneeling at his feet and with biting conviction, like with a, a punch to the gut, Jesus answers this mother with the most penetrating comment. Look at verse 20, 22. You don't know what you're asking. You, you don't know what you're asking here. You want to elevate these guys? You don't know what you're asking. And the crazy thing is that must have stung an awful lot. Because she surely thought she did know what she was asking. Because in her world, as in our world, soldiers were decorated with medals. Emperors had crowns. Governors had people who waited on them hand and foot. Merchants had employees. It seemed only fitting that her two sons would somehow have a throne because after all, they were charter members of this up and coming ministry and every Every ruler, every leader should have a throne, right? And Jesus responds, but not in this movement. Jesus pulls his disciples aside and he spells out with very sharp contrast the difference between what it means to be a follower of his and what it's like to be in the world. Notice what he says, verse 25. Jesus calls them together and he says this, you know, you know this, that the rulers of this world, they lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those who are under them. But among you, he says, talking to his 12 friends, among you it's going to be different. Whoever wants to be, notice that, whoever wants to be a leader, among you must first be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must first become a slave. For even the Son of Man, as he describes himself, for even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for men. Like when you, when you look at all of our organizations, all of our world around us, there, is a, a distinct, there are distinct levels of authority all around us. Governments have presidents who have cabinets who have citizens, right? Right? The military has both officers and enlisted men. And in between each of those are ranks of authority. In sports, there are coaches, and then there are players, and then there are referees, and then there are fans. In, 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 in the business world, there are corporate heads, and then there are lines of authorities that are drawn between those who are managers of people and their personnel, between superintendents and those who are just day laborers. And, and the, the, the person who is in the labor force, the person, who is, the person who is actually doing the work is expected to punch a clock and show up on time and work hard and not take advantage of their employer. Because there's a name for those who choose not to be, to, to go in that direction. And the name is simply that they're unemployed because the boss is the one who is in charge. The leader is the one. And that's the way the system works. And, and Jesus puts it very clearly. There are great men who exercise authority over people. There are great leaders who do that. But then he says this, but not so among you. Not so among the kingdom. Not so in his church. Not so for Valley View. Why isn't that so? Because in the kingdom of God, there's this one great body of us. And you know what we all have as a title? Servant. Servants. Like, like, like the way to the top of this place is through serving other. Whoever wants to be first among you must, must lower yourself and become a slave. Those, those are forgotten words. Those are the words that we don't like to read again and again and again in Scripture. Those are, those are words that are unnerving and unpopular. They are disregarded words. They are ignored and they are neglected. There doesn't seem to be too many servants with the servant mentality in our world. Even in church. Right? Even in church. Like we have somehow lost sight of the, the primary calling of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And that's it. Like you're called to be a servant leader. Someone who leads people, but someone who serves them along the way. 
And may, maybe your perspective of leading other people, maybe the reason you're, you're not willing to lead others is because you've lost your perspective and it doesn't square up with the attitude that Jesus Christ has. Maybe somehow you've, in, you've skidded into a pattern of, of calling the shots and finding it very difficult just to lower your stuff, yourself to help someone. Maybe, maybe, maybe perhaps the desire to be a good leader has elbowed its way in front of your desire to just simply imitate Jesus. Those words hurt. That's why Paul wrote to the church in Colossae these words. He said, listen, there, there is a body of Christ, us, but there's only one head, and his name is Jesus. And no human being will ever dare take his position away from him. Only Christ is the head. The rest of us are, are, are what, Paul, what Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 20. We're, both just, we're all just servant-hearted leaders. Listen, we can't be Jesus, but we can be like him. And let me just say this. Valley View needs you. This church needs you. It's, it's time for you not just to, to be a fan. It's time for you to join the team. It's time for you to start taking some of the, the ministry off our shoulders. It's time for you to join up and be a part of, uh, be someone who serves, someone who gives, someone who helps around here. Val Valley View is, listen, as a church, we're more interested in you being engaged and involved in a ministry than we are you just sitting here watching the show. We want you to be involved. And, and listen, this model, this heart of a leader, it will serve its mission, the, the mission of the kingdom. And so I, I wonder sometimes, has, has God's mission captured your heart? Has the mission of God become instrumental in your life? Has the mission of God become the driving force in your life that helps you make every decision you will ever make in life? how you use your funding, how you spend your time, whether or not you're going to choose to wake up and be here with other people who believe. See, the model isn't of being a servant leader isn't just for the church. And it's not just for the corporate world. It's also even a, a mother's heart could be captured by the mission of, of God. Like those of you who are mothers, those of you who do have children, you need to instill into your kids to raise them and equip their, your sons and daughters to be those who, who serve and have mission in their life. And serve them by equipping them and, and encouraging them and helping them have the resources so that someday when God's mission takes hold in their life, they understand why they're following Jesus. The servant leadership model is not only for the business world and for the church, it's for your home and those that you're around. And heart, your heart will make it happen. Only a servant's heart can accomplish that kind of leadership. And the condition of your heart allows God just to reveal just exactly what it is you're called to do. A servant's heart brings a leader into the lives of those that it leads. It sets your agenda aside and you adopt his agenda. But here's the problem. You and I, we don't tend to lead like Jesus. We don't tend to lead like Jesus because our natural tendencies take over versus our spiritual tendencies. There's a book on leadership by J. Oswald Sanders who, who writes about the differences between natural tendencies and spiritual tendencies. And it looks like this. He says the reason that we lead differently than Jesus is because naturally we're self-confident instead of being confident in God. Naturally, we want to be known and know men instead of wanting to know God. Naturally, we want to make our own decisions instead of seeking what God's will for our life is. Naturally, we would be ambitious and run over people rather than being humble and help people. Naturally, we would want to originate our own methods and ideologies instead of adopting and listening and following God's methods. We, some of us in this room enjoy commanding others rather than delighting in being obedient to God, he says. Some of us are motivated by personal gain instead of being motivated by the love that God has for you to help others. And some of us are just too independent instead of dependent upon God. Listen, the differences between those 
who lead out of their heart's natural tendencies and those who lead by spiritual tendencies is really clear. And Jesus is calling you and I to lead like him, to be like him. But let me say this, you will never become a servant leader until you become a servant to the leader. Until you become servant to him, you will never be a servant leader. Your mission and purpose in this life spring from the relationship that you have with God and the issue of submission will always get in your way because you and I, we don't like submission. We don't like subjecting ourselves to anyone other than ourselves. We naturally resist submission. We like to make our own decisions, carve our own paths. And we live in a culture where everyone is trying to be God instead of to be like God. We struggle between submitting to anything or anyone outside of ourselves. When Jesus just simply says, would you just serve other people and you'll be like me. See, spiritual leadership involves both mission, God, what do you want me to do? And then a submission of being willing to do what God is asking you to do. Mission and submission. Because in the kingdom, servants lead and leaders serve. And a God-sized mission needs to be capturing the hearts of every one of us in this room. Every kingdom leader is a servant leader. And every great kingdom leader lives without compromise to the mission that God has for this church. And every great kingdom leader is willing to inspire other people and serve them and lead them to the point where they find Jesus. So I want to close by asking you a question and then giving you a challenge. Here's the question. Does anything matter more to you than the mission of God? Like what's greater in your life than the mission of God? What, what literally occupies time, space, mental energy, resources, actions, than the mission of God in your life? That's my question for you. Here's my challenge. And I know what you're going to do because you'll do this naturally. You'll put your hands up. Here's my challenge. I want to invite you to join our team. It's easy to be a fan. It's hard to be on the field. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to pull out your phone. I pulled mine out. Those of you who have your phones with you, I want you to put your mouth where your phone is, right? And on our website, vvcc.org slash teams. You can pull it out right now. There are three pull-down boxes. We provided it for you because we think, wow, some of you struggle to know, I don't know where I'd serve. I don't know where I'd submit. I don't know what to do. And here's just some categories for you just to say, you know what, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in working with adults. I'm interested in being a leader. I'm interested in serving with kids. I'm interested in technology. I'm interested in writing. I'm interested in creativity. I'm interested in all kinds of categories. You just choose three. Give us your name, your phone number. I know you're scared to death to do that, some of you, but give that to us, and we promise to get back to you. We won't share it. We won't sell it. We won't do anything like that. We just want you to be on our team because it's easy to sit in the stands and on the sidelines and watch others take the beating. And we would love for you, we would love for you to be on our team. And listen, if you don't have your phone with you today and you can't put your mouth where your phone is, right, we want you to go out into the lobby. There's a kiosk out there where we would love for you just to take some time. And you, you may be thinking like, like, like what Cynthia said on the video, I'm too old to do this. No, you're not. There's always something a some place for you to serve. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm too young to do this. Or maybe you don't think you're qualified to do this. Just give us a chance to have a conversation with you about the multitude of opportunities that are out there. Some of you are so hospitable. Some of you are really good at making food. We can use that. Some of you are really good at art. We can use that. Some of you are really good at sports. We can do that. Some of you could take my job. That would be great. <laughs> we just need to use you. God needs you on the team. I want to pray for you. God in heaven, thank you for 
providing for us this, this day, giving us a chance to think about what it means to be in your kingdom and giving us a chance to think about what it means to be a leader, giving us a chance just to think about what it means to serve people. God, we have ministries throughout our church that just need some help. And I'm look, sitting here looking at a room full of people who want to do the right thing. God, would your spirit just work on them today? It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen.